Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with uh, George Lewis to uh, talk about uh, empathy. And, and uh, George is a photographer, and he's been focusing on um, exploring the topic of empathy. And he recently uh, gave a talk on the power of empathy at uh, Queens College at the uh, Center for Ethical and Racial and uh, religious understanding. Uh, thanks for joining me for this dialogue, George. Edwin, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share some of my ideas. Um, yeah, we're going to try be trying some new things. Uh, since you're a photographer, we're actually going to try to use uh, the Google Share, uh, uh, the uh, Death Share feature to actually so show some of the photographs and talk about them. But before we get into there, would you like to say anything more about yourself by way of uh, introduction? And Definitely. I mean, for, for, for me, one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century is, is to, to find a way how to make people f be more visible to one another. Um, in a way, we need to find each other, understand other people's deepest concerns. And we need to lay the foundations for a sort of new global human identity, one that really transcends our differences, um, it goes beyond them, and is predicated on a sort of mutual understanding. And for me, it's one that celebrates the beauty of difference. It accepts difference, but it understands that we are different, but we're all part of the same human story. I, I, I subscribe very much to George Bernard Shaw's statement that there's only one religion, but there are 150 versions of it. And I, and I think you know, we get so caught up in, in, in the other, in the other being different. And for me, it's about trying to identify with otherness and make it more understandable. Because like Martin Luther King, when, when we don't understand, we tend to be frightened. And when we're frightened, we get angry. And that's when hate tends to take over. So for me, empathy and art's very tied together because for me, it's always been about trying to understand a sense of otherness. So to go into the, into, it's not so much sympathy, empathy, it's actually trying to understand objectively what that other person is. And by understanding that person, I'll respect that person. We may be different, but I can then at least be able to ex explain in myself what that person represents and, and not be so distrustful. So I've spent mm -hmm. a lot of the time over the years traveling around the world. I think I've been to close to 75 countries. I've lived in the Arab world for a number of years. Um, and now I find myself here in New York. I've been here for two years. And I've worked very closely with many different uh, groups. I've worked, been very privileged to be able to work closely with a number of different Jewish organizations. So well, I work with Americans for Peace now. Uh, I've just been to Israel. And um, I, I try and use soft power, my photography, as a way to reach out and show the human side. I'm probably not very interested in big politics because big politics has failed. It has ultimately failed in our ability to reach out and understand what it is to be human. And for me, it's about EQ as much as IQ, the emotional quotient being, being harnessed with intelligent quotient. And, and that's when I think we'll be more satisfied as a human species. Mm. So I'm, I'm wondering, how did you get involved in empathy? Because if I, you know, look at your uh, website, and it's like uh, the whole website is really kind of geared around uh, empathy. Like you've got headings there, profiles and empathy, ecological empathy, kinesthetic empathy. You know, you've given this talk on empathy. So it seems to be very fo focal to what you're you're working on. And I'm wondering, you know, what was it that that got you kind of interested in empathy and even to start using the word empathy because you're very conscious about you know, using, you know, talking uh, about it. It's a, it's a good question, Edwin. I think, you know, nothing happens in isolation. Um, I think I've always, not always, for a long time now, though, I've been interested in, 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 in people different from myself. I mean, I went to a very, very strict English, socially strict English school. I was sent away to boarding school at seven and a half. It was all boys. And I remember, you know, at the age of seven and a half, eight, there was one boy who was different to me. And I was quite interested by him because I could learn about different things. He had a different perspective. He happened to be Jewish. He wasn't Christian. And, and I found that fascinating, you know, going to his bar mitzvah 
edu was an education for me. And yet, of course, so many of the people I grew up with never really had those types of experiences outside their group. Now, that is typical of the vast majority of people on this planet, that they stick to their own group. But for me, from very early on, I was always interested in otherness. But coming here to New York, certainly meeting um, uh, Mark Rosenblum, who I know you've interviewed, he's been uh, quite a uh, uh, mentor to me, um, you know, with him setting up the, the, um, the, the, the Center for Ethnic and Racial and Religious Understanding at Queen's College. Um, so things haven't happened in isolation. I, I've met some very interesting people who, 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 who've helped me and suggested good books for me to read, and I think empathy is probably one of the best ways to explain it. Um, empathy, compassion, trying to understand a sense of otherness, as I said. Mm. So I'm hearing that kind of growing up in England, I guess it, it, it was kind of more of a, uh, I don't know, I'm thinking of monotone, but it was kind of more everyone was kind of the same, uh, you know, British or what have you. And then there was someone who was different, and it was kind of your curiosity, you were kind of drawn to that different uh, difference and kind of as a way of uh, kind of learning and kind of seeing another perspective. And that then there was uh, working with, uh, you know, the center there um, for ethnic and religious uh, understanding. Um, that it was kind of like, that was like an inspiration to kind of go deeper into this. Is for that, sure, uh -huh. absolutely for sure. Um, I, I also think coming to New York, as I said, after living in the Arab world has really helped me understand mm. uh, uh, you know, on a on an emotional side, uh, the, the complexity of you know the Israeli-Palestinian question, and just generally how do Muslims, how do Jews, how do Christians all actually fit together in the big jigsaw? And I think what it is, Edwin, is we focus solely currently in our culture on our differences. We don't actually say, okay, here are the differences, but also now let's look at the similarities, and they are vast. But, and so for me as an artist, I really do want to, well, even with some of my images, which are quite challenging, show the human side, the human story, which is about connectivity and being interconnected, which for me is what the 21st century has to be more about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's about connectivity then. You're, you're kind of focusing, you're looking for what is it that connects people and how do they connect and looking for that aspect then? I, I think so. I mean, whether it's religious, whether it's sexual. When I say sexual, I mean male, female, or proclivity, you know, homo, or whatever. Or whether it's um, racial, or whether it's um, a, from an age perspective. We do tend to, especially if I may say in America, put people very much into sort of a black and white camp. They're this rather than that. In a way, I'm a man of nuance. And I know that's a French word, and a French word is often quite suspicious in, in here in the United States today. But I think we need to look at the gray areas. We need to understand the multiple shades uh, of gray, if you like. I mean, obviously, you know, 50 shades of gray, that term has been somewhat hijacked by this popular book that's just come out. But I do feel um, we, we need to look at the, the nuance of, of life, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I was just seeing uh, your website here. I was thinking we could start with uh, some sharing, looking at your website real quick and then go on to... Uh, talk about those photographs that, that you wanted to talk about. Would that, would that work? That would, be, that would work very well, yes. Okay, well, let me try this screen sharing here. And uh, you know, I'm doing this. Oh, there we go. Select window. There we go. So um, that's your website. Uh, George H. Lewis, and you can see it as profiles in empathy, kinesthetic empathy, and e ecological empathy. So you're looks like you're. Would you like to explain that a little bit? What that's yeah, about? I mean, this is a relatively new format I've created for my website. The bulk of it is on profiles and empathy, and I'm looking at many different types of cultural juxtapositions. So I mean, the one you've just opened up actually is two women who are in a lesbianic relationship and one is a dominant and one is a sub, and this is how they live their life. Now, I've used humor. I mean, you know, the lady who's a dominant is sitting on top drinking a glass of whiskey, um, but, and it, I find it aesthetically quite an interesting image that I've created. But I think you know, we do tend to jump to conclusions very quickly, and especially on things that we're uncomfortable about. And mm. I think a lot of people, the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, the Abrahamic faith, has a huge problem with sexual energy because ultimately within the Christian tradition 
there are only really two uh, archetypes for women. One is a virgin and one is a whore. And to me, that is unacceptable in the 21st century. I think, you know, human beings were much more nuanced and complex than that. Um, so a lot of my work does tend to explore ideas of what, is, what it is to be human using sexuality as a mechanism to explore some of these ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is that also judgment? Because you're saying that there's the two. There's the, the uh, you know, you're either a virgin or a whore, and it's very judgmental there. That's, that's yes, some, uh, I think it is. And I think, you know, if empathy, let's actually now, this is a segue, Edwin, into talking actually what does empathy mean? You know, I think it, actually you once said, you know, in one of your interviews that you can define empathy firstly as imaginative empathy or cognitive empathy, you know, putting oneself into the shoes of others. It's as an act of genuine interpersonal emotional sharing. But then there's the other side, which I think is so important, which is self-empathy or sensory awareness. So being mindful and the two are inherently connected. Um, so one can't really have one without the other. I mean, if you took on an Islamic point of view, uh, you know, the greater jihad is actually the battle of the ego. The lesser jihad is the battle of defensive warfare. We need to really, I feel, focus much more on understanding ourselves and, and almost judging ourselves way ahead of trying to judge the other, because that would actually get rid of a lot of the pain in our current civilization if we were able just to you know, question our egos and maybe borrow from the Eastern religions a bit more. Maybe borrow and look towards Buddhism and Hinduism. If that allows the Western traditions to have more poise for thought, one can make a state, an argument, of course, for a greater sense of, 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 of esoteric, uh, the pendulum to swing a little bit further back towards esotericism in the sense that, you know, we live in a very doctrinal world within Christianity and Islam and Judaism at the moment. You only have to see this playing out in parts of America or parts of Islamic world or parts of Israel where there is an intolerance and we need to maybe let that pendulum swing a little bit more towards the other side which is more emotional intelligence and a sense of um, understanding our ego which I think Buddhism in a way can, can help us. I mean many of my Buddhist friends really feel that Jesus when you really break him down to who he was he was a man who was about orthopraxy. He was not a man about orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. It was a man about how you live the life for now. It's how well, you stay present. And that's yeah. what I feel we should do. More. Yeah, so I was hearing, you know, you were talking about the definition. So you were talking about, you know, people talking about this cognitive empathy, but then you started talking about the self-empathy. So that's a matter of, of connecting with, our, with ourselves. Yes. And um, so do you see those two parts, kind of this cognitive and self-empathy and kind of a, the, the self being more of an emotional empathy or yes. kind of, what, what's your model there or well, experience? Uh, my experience, I'm not so good on models. I leave, <laughs> I leave that to the academics. And uh -huh. I mean, you know, I'm not an expert. I will preface this. I am an artist. I'm a human being who uses my art as a way not only to help other people, but probably to help myself as much as other people. This is my journey as much as a journey is my journey. And I think when I'm at my best, it's a journey I can share with others. And it's wonderful that you can give me this opportunity to get this out to more people, that we can be on this journey together. And it takes away the hubris. It takes away the sense of I'm right and you're wrong. I mean, wasn't it Halal who said, you know, when he was asked about religion, um, well, do unto others as, as you would do unto yourself. And the rest is commentary. You know, I feel religion has been hijacked slightly. I mean, Karen Armstrong gives a wonderful talk on, on a TED talk on this. And she won that, the compassion, uh, I think it was compassion for empathy or something a couple of years. Uh, it's a charter for compassion. She won a TED uh, prize and then she, she used $100,000 to uh, put together this uh, charter for compassion, yeah, uh, yeah. saying that the, the core of all religions is, is, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto, you know, yes. unto, as you would have them do unto you. Yes. And uh, so it's compassion and empathy, basically. But I mean, I must answer your question. Um, you asked me about imaginative or cognitive empathy and obviously self-empathy, and I feel self-empathy is very important. But ultimately, it's when you combine the two is when you really get that common sense of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, we therefore want to contribute to other people's well-being when we combine it. We actually become more selfless, and uh, we, 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 we want to, it makes us feel good. It's actually, self 
selfish because when you actually help other people, it makes you feel good. I mean, you secrete more oxytocin or the, the love drug is actually connected to empathy, you know, and, and you feel better. So it's a win-win situation. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's a, I, maybe I can just share with you my, I have two parts of empathy. I call it the wheel and feel of empathy. So one is kind of that academic kind of the model and the other is kind of the experiential. So uh, for the model of empathy, I see empathy as, 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 um, as uh, four parts. There's the self-empathy, so that's sensory awareness, mindfulness of what's going on inside of ourselves. And then as we have kind of space and openness, we can have that kind of uh, mirrored empathy, uh, which, I, which is kind of like the second part, which is through mirror neurons as I'm waving my hands. Absolutely. You know, you're, I thought I you're, start imitating you're, that. you're imitating it. You're feeling yeah. the energy and so forth. And then the third part is is uh, an imaginative empathy, or you know sometimes it's called cognitive empathy or perspective taking, that you can kind of use, uh, imagine yourself in the other person's situation. You use you know you're tapping into your own feelings and experiences, but kind of like an actor, you know you're taking on the role and saying, well, what would the world look like from that point of view? And then the uh, fourth part is, is um, empathic uh, arising or action or creativity. I, I'm kind of playing with those different words. But that's as, as we connect with each other and we see and feel more deeply into each other, that like you were saying, that we want to contribute to each other's welfare. It's kind of like a basic uh, human drive that we just want to contribute you know it's not it's not not only in suffering but you know if, if we're being creative i want to have you be you know support you in being even more creative Absolutely. you want to say something there? No, I, I totally agree with that i think you know already by having this conversation and you and i have never met in the flesh there is already i feel a barrier has been broken down and it is part of relationship building now, of course, it's impossible to have that with everyone. No one's advocating that at all. But I think to use these type of concepts really help us understand otherness, as I call it. And that means we're much less likely to want to fight or to, to hate because there's less um, fear, because there's more communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the fear that uh, kind of inhibits. Like, you know, I was talking about the self-empathy. If I'm fearful, it's kind of shutting down uh, my experience, uh, you know, and openness to be able to, you know, have the other forms of empathy so that, uh, yeah, is a major part. So that's kind of the model a bit that I kind of operate from, you know, at, at the present and it keeps changing and, and developing. But then the other part is the feel of empathy. So that's just saying, well, what does it feel like to be empathic? And I think that's where the, where the arts really comes in because it's trying to convey the experiential feeling of empathy. So um, I don't know, what, what do you think about that? You know, right, the feeling. I mean, that's quite a good segue maybe into one of my first images, if that's possible. Okay, yeah, do you want it to? Um, the, if, if we could find one. Um, which yeah, we're gonna, so we're going to go through your images here. And let me, so we're here on your website. Let me just no, say no, no, quickly. No, no, no. Let's go. No, go to the images I sent to you before the interview. Yeah, I, I, so I just clicked there. there so that's, that's, um, uh, I think what's good about this image, Edwin, is it's a very good way to start because here you're beginning with the epitome of empathy. And it, it, listen, it's a very literal, explicit juxtaposition. This it's the leaning in of two social, religious identities supporting one another. You've got the phys physical proximity of separate identities here, and it's idealized. It's an idealized version of empathy. But the question is, is, how do we reach this place authentically? And with my photography and with the subsequent pieces that I can show you today, you know, I want the viewer to contemplate the work by thinking out of the box, out of his own comfort zone, so he can notice the relationships that are being depicted and their emotional states. So when we get inside other people's realities, we tend to empathize more. Uh -huh. So here you're, you're, you're showing two different religions that are in conflict with each other, but then there's this sense, this feeling of there's some kind of a connection going on. Yeah. And, and in my experience, and you know, I, I learn experientially, I travel throughout the world and I've just been to Israel and I've spent many, many years off and on in the Middle East. And I've actually met many Arabs and Jews who are in romantic relationships with, with one another. And I find that just wonderful. 
Um, and yet, you know, you turn on the news today, you would think that would be totally impossible. I, I just think, I, 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 with these sort of images, I want the human to sort of just lessen the hatred a little bit more and just be, begin to believe that things are possible. Because if Israel and Palestine is to actually change, we've got to have a paradigm shift. And it's got to be much more based on soft power rather than hard power. It's got to be based on emotional knowledge as much as intelligent knowledge and a sense that we aren't always right and we all have different perspectives depending on where we live in the world. I mean, I'm a Christian because I was born in England and I was born from an old English perspective. I mean, if I'd been born in, in, in Arabia or, or in 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 another part of the world, I, I may have been Islamic or Jewish or Hindu. And I think humans have got to realize that, that we are partly who we are because of our, our, our born identities. And I think by coming to terms with that, we can then try and move beyond some of those tribal senses, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting you mentioned that you'd uh, traveled so much. And I did a lot of traveling too. So after our high school year, I spent 10 years traveling around the world. And that was kind of one of the realizations I also came to is, hey, if I was born here, I would be this religion. I would be doing just what the people are doing here. So once you start seeing that, um, it kind of like opens up, the, you know, some thought there about the, you know, how relative some of this, these uh, beliefs yeah. are. I think that's right. I mean, I live for about a year in Oman, and Oman is a wonderful, gentle country. I mean, most, a lot of Americans aren't quite sure where it is. It's north of Yemen and it's east of Saudi Arabia and, and sort of um, east, south, southeast of Dubai. And it's a country, you know, half the size of Texas. It's huge. Um, but it, it, it's a very gentle religion. Uh, it's a very gentle country. And so for me, I had some wonderful experiences there and I, I did a lot of painting and photography out there. I had exhibitions out there. And that was a great introduction to the Arab world for me. Um, and, and the people are very, very family orientated and they just have a different culture. And for me, it was just great education to, to see that. And of course, now coming to live in New York, having you know spent much time in Yemen and in Qatar and the UAE and Syria and Jordan, I now work in New York and I work with many different groups. I mean, I work with the Arab Muslims here, but I work closely with the Hasidic and the Orthodox community, Jewish communities, uh, with Reform and Conservative Jewish communities. And it's a privilege to work with so many different types. And you see that there's ultimately human beings are much more alike than we all like to admit, in my mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so that's really what this uh, with this uh, photograph uh, kind of shows. Then is that. Uh, that uh, connection that different cultures can have. But it's, it is idealized because uh -huh. of something like this, you know, doesn't unfortunately happen that much. And uh, so that may segue into my next photograph, which we could share with you, which actually moves away from religion uh, in a sense, but goes more towards ideas of uh, gender and sexuality to an extent. So here we have um, on first, observation. You might think, you know, this is a man um, in some form of solicitation with a woman, and one's not quite sure what it, what's really going on, um, but he sits there ready to negotiate. Um, she can barely look at him, or perhaps is just being a little coy, but the truth, we don't really know, but the true story is quite different. Yudi, the man on our right, is an ultra-Orthodox Jew, and he's actually glancing at himself but in his alto ego, as Sylvia Sparklestein. So this is what he transforms into at night time. He becomes this transvestite. How does he navigate this space as an ultra-Orthodox Jew who then becomes a transvestite at night time? Um, the butterflies in the back, they represent transformation. And many of the other pictures fill in more of his Jewish narrative, capturing the tension between his conservative orthodoxy and his secular transgender identity. But uh, for, for, for me, it's, it's really about us, the viewer. How do we cope? How do we react, react to this? If we're Jewish, we might react uncomfortably because he's ultra-Orthodox. If we're not, we might react to the fact that he's conservative and he then becomes uh, a, a transvestite. 
um, then does that mean he's gay? You know, uh, there, all these sort of questions come to the fore. And for me, it's really about trying to break down those prejudices because I know in my experience, the times I've judged the most are the times when I'm most ignorant and most frightened. Mm -hmm. And so are you doing this photograph to uh, just to get people kind of thinking or, or uh, like I mean, what, what's a, going uh, on or try to put, yeah. yeah, sorry, it was, a wonderful, it was a wonderful opportunity obviously to be able to capture this man who I met and befriended and he allowed me to photograph him in his two states. So obviously this is a composite photograph. I photographed him with the tripod sitting in his Orthodox Jewish cost outfit. And then of course he changed and got into to his, UD, uh, his Sylvia Sparklestein outfit. And, um, and then I stitched the two photographs together. Um, I mean, he's actually holding a glass of wine and um, you'll see uh, Sylvia Sparkle's team's actually just lit the candles. So there is this sense of Shabbat, of, of uh, I think I called it a bait. Um, actually, I, I think I, I can't remember what I called it now. Um, um, peaceful home um, in, in, in Hebrew, bait, uh, yeah, bait shalom. There we go. I called it bait shalom. Um, and in a way, this is, there are many shades of sexuality. If we judge so hard the other, that for me, raises as many questions about the viewer doing the judging um, than the subject viewed. What makes us uncomfortable and why? So for, for me, this image is just as much about trying to educate other people about um, senses of otherness, as well as capturing a reality within the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community here in New York City. Mm. So, yeah, so it's, I guess, uh I mean, you kind of see that too, right? The the uh, Orthodox Jew would be, you'd imagine, would be very judgmental of a transvestite. That that would be really something that they would judge uh, harshly. I would imagine. But then the gay community would probably judge very harshly anyone who's ultra orthodox or or conservative Muslim or conservative Christian. I mean, I mm -hmm. think to be. I mean, really, ultimately, I need to do this within every single faith because you've got these contradictions in all faiths. Mm, there, is, mm -hmm. there is one thing, Edwin, which I feel very strongly about, and that is, I've mentioned it before and I'll mention it again, is to do with sexual energy. The Abrahamic faiths have really done a huge disservice to um, uh, humanity in the sense of how they have suppressed sexual energy. And to be human is, is, is partly to be sexual, it is also to be spiritual, and it is to be many things. But when you suppress sexual energy, I think it comes out in nefarious ways. And so for me, the 21st century, I want a much more of an honest discussion and understanding of what it is to be human. And we use science very closely here, very cleverly to back up this, that, you know, as we discover how the brain works and how the body functions more and more, we can understand by the biology of why we are like we are and the feelings we have. And I think religion and science needs to work much more closely together in the 21st century and not mm. be so separate. And so maybe instead of having those judgments about sexuality is actually empathize with it and, exactly. and hear, like, what, what is it, you know, what is it that, uh, um, what is it that you're experiencing to be able to share that and to uh, kind of feel it and empathize with it and put yourself in, into uh, uh, the shoes of, of the other person and let, let yourself resonate with that uh, energy. Yes. I think that's it. I couldn't say that better than myself, and I hope these images do slightly help, you know, um, uh, generate a discussion on on who we are, and you know, whether you're a Muslim, Hindu, Jew, Christian, or a secularist, an atheist, it doesn't really matter. But having the sense of, you know, I'm not always right, and the ego doesn't have to dominate my whole vision of the world. When you say ego, what do you mean by that? Because I hear that word uh, come up a lot. Even you know, Karen Armstrong with, talks about it as well. And I'm not quite sure what people mean by it when they say that. I mean, I have my own kind of thoughts about it, but I'm wondering what it kind of what comes up for you about the ego. Well, I, the ego. I'll explain it a couple of ways, if I may. Um, I, I, it, within the Western tradition. 
uh, the ego is very much very important because our whole life is predicated on who we are as individuals. Within the Eastern traditions, traditionally, they're, they're less about the ego. And in certain Mayanist Buddhist interpretations, it's much more about almost suppression or going beyond the ego. For me, it's not about vanquishing the ego. It's about understanding its power and how actually it can tell us a great lot of untruths. So it's about trying to um, not allow the mind to totally control our bodies and our thought processes, because the mind sometimes can be used um, uh, in a slightly uh, it, 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 egotistical, in the sense it can be very e we can be very egotistical, and the world centre around I, where if you can go beyond the ego, the world then suddenly becomes more collective. So for me. Uh, when I talk about the ego, I, 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 I don't want to get rid of the ego, but I want to understand it better and place it within the context of the greater collective. And then in a sense, the, 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 the more negative aspects of egotism can, be, can, can wash away. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that sense of self and kind of it could be kind of make, sometimes the ego could be, uh, I mean, there's different versions of the ego, I guess, is... There's a sense of self, and then um, sounds like you're wanting to. Okay, you can have that sense of self, but also have that sense of the other as well. If I'm hearing it correctly, and that's where empathy comes in uh -huh. more than, say, sympathy, because sympathy is getting emotionally involved often, and it can be short-lived in another person's emotional well-being. Where empathy sometimes is standing back, but and actually being quite sort of functional and logical about that other person, really trying to understand that person and not getting too emotionally involved necessarily. And so you, you, do, you do still maintain a distance, but you have a greater sense of understanding of, of, of the other. As a result, then it helps you realize that you're not separate. And so we're all connected. Uh -huh. So to quote George Bernard Shaw yet again, it's the sense that you know, there's only one religion, but there are 150 versions of it. And, you know, currently we seem to fight to death over these 150 versions of it. I mean, I'm interested in bias. And the bias, you know, which we come out of Persia 150 years ago, in a way is quite universalist. And for me, the great religions, Jesus was, was quite universalist in my mind when he started. And then the church, the churches have, uh, through just the way we are as humans, we're imperfect. We politicize it. We religiousize it. Again, orthodoxy, not orthopraxy. I, I think the practice is really important. Um, so I want my art, my art to try and get closer to what it is in orthoprax in orthopractic terms. Mm -hmm. Well, there was one thing that was kind of what I want to kind of just look at is uh, you were talking about that. There's this notion that with empathy, that you're kind of you're kind of detaching. And you know, I've been thinking about that, that what it is, is, is it's not so much just detaching, but connecting to the whole. Uh, so not, it's probably a better way of putting it, because attachment might suggest something pejorative. It is actually standing back in order to be holistic. Yeah, to connect and empathize with the whole, right? I, I have that sense that when I'm empathizing with someone also, especially if it's in a very conflicted situation, that I'm trying to maintain my connection to myself, to the environment around me, and to all people who are involved. So I actually feel that the the empathy is like a greater uh, a greater connection versus. I mean, some people talk about, well, you got to be detached from the world, but I, I don't think it's quite. I think it's really more about you wanting to be more connected to to a larger sense of, of, of space and reality. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, okay, well, I just, just you, you brought that up, and I just really wanted to make, uh, you know, because that's, I, I'd thought about that before, so really wanted to kind of, uh, you know, add to that. I mean, that um, actually, can I say, that actually, in a way, segues quite well into um, my next piece, which, in a way, I want to start talking about the sacred feminine. Okay. And, em and, and em emotional intelligence. Um, this one, yeah. I mean, so on the face of it, you have a, a symbol of balance and empowerment, a symbol of complete freedom, uh, the subjective reconciliation of tradition and modernity even. Um, maybe capitalism and religious belief. You have a Muslim woman on her Harley Davidson in the desert 
with actually Abu Dhabi, the, the capital of the United Arab Emirates, behind. So it's a city near Dubai. And but for me, what I love about this image is, you know, in in, in Saudi Arabia, a woman can't obviously ride a, a, a drive a car, let alone a motorbike. Um, but here we have a woman being in control of her own destiny, and you could make uh, a metaphor that she's leaving the, the phallic symbols of the city of masculinity behind her, and she's going off on her own journey. Um, she's on something which is very masculine, a Harley Davidson. Um, and of course it's got a bit of humor. She's wearing Louboutin shoes and she's, you know, got her, so her leg showing, which of course to some parts of Islam will be very controversial because she's a Muslim woman. But you see, for me it represents, this image is wanting us to talk about gender and women's position in the world and more specifically in the Middle East. This image is also, you know, slightly tongue-in-cheek, so I hopefully it'll do it, do it with, with tenderness. But um, I, I think it also talks about um, the sacred feminine. And I mean, there's a great Indian mystic, um, Aurobindo, who said, if there is to be a future, it will clearly wear the crown of feminine design. So unless we awaken to the mystery of the sacred feminine and allow it to penetrate every area of our activity, uh, creating harmony, we will we will die out and take nature or a large part of it with us. So for me, the 21st century has to be fully actualizing uh, the sacred feminine, which is in us men. I mean, you, Edward, you and I, uh, we're men. The sacred feminine in, is in us as much as it is in women. It's in all of us. And I think in Western Occidental society, um, men are very scared of the sacred feminine because they see what is emotional as feminine, i.e. weak. And I think we need to re-educate the young that actually to be emotionally strong, um, which is seen to be feminine, is not just, uh, it is the opposite of weak, it is, it is strength, and it will give a lot to civilization. Mm -hmm. So you're really valuing the uh, feminine, and you, you're kind of adding a sacredness, like that it's like a very important, um, something to be kind of honored or Mm -hmm. uh, but it's in us all. I mean, and of course we look to women uh, because women do things differently. I mean, and it's not to say that the pendulum needs to go the other way where we need a, a matriarchy. I'm not for remotely suggesting that, but I just want that pendulum to be a little bit closer to the middle where, um, you know, uh, women can make decisions along with men because I know that men and women, when they're together, they make better decisions because we balance each other out. I mean, books have been written about this, Mars and Venus and yin and yang and all that but so for me this image just just shows I, we, we need to push with the sense of the sacred feminine in all of us because it will make us uh, human in the way that we have capability of becoming mm. well let me perhaps I could share a few thoughts on this we'll look at it and then maybe discuss it a little bit um, if that works mm. uh, that, you know, for me, there, we're talking about the sacred feminine. I think that what it's alluding to is actually empathy, that in society, that it's been women to a large extent that have, you know, had the role of empathizing because of the nurturing of the children and kind of holding that space. So for me, in a sense, that what you're talking about, the sacred feminine, is uh, empathy, is the value of, of uh, em empathy. And um, I sometimes have a problem with that using the word sacred feminine in the sense that, uh, you know, men are thinking, oh, my God, I got to have my sacred feminine or and other, you know, sometimes they do get into it. But it's really uh, it's really a matter of, uh, for me, of promoting empathy in everyone. It's like, yeah. you know, men have empathy, women have empathy. We all have the capacity for empathy. It's actually maybe traditionally it's kind of been put into the camp for women, you know, more, but um, it doesn't have to be. It's just kind of a social, um, uh, you know, construct or however it kind of came about. So we all have the capacity for empathy and that we could uh, be promoting that, uh, that value um, kind of more explicitly. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, people are, men are going to be scared of this term sacred feminine. Some men will be, but they need not to be because it's in us all. It's a question of just the emotional intelligence, the, em the empathetic, empathic side of, of our very nature. I mean, I could look at it another way that 
you know, for many people, for many years, people thought that life was all about, I think Burke said it was Hobbes, um, forgive me, it was Hobbes who said it was short, brutal, uh, I, I can't remember the full term, but it was, you know, life was individualistic and it was brutal and it was short. And man is ultimately a selfish creature. Well, that is true in part. But the other part is man is equally as compassionate, as empathetic, as kind and generous. And I think, you know, the paradigm shift of the 21st century, Edwin, has to be about focusing as much on those things that we're discussing as, as well as the more individualistic 20th century narratives that we've all got so used to. Yeah, and uh, your photography helps for that uh, dialogue as we're seeing right now. So, um, okay, are, are you ready for the next uh, one? For sure, yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's the uh, camel. And is oh, yes. Well, this one, is, in a way, is more about ecological empathy. Um, I, I, this image is called the roar of nature, and this is a bull camel standing very... Uh, he's very annoyed. We have some Bedouin friends of mine. I shot this on the border of Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. This is the largest oil refinery in the world. I can assure you that we've all drunk from this oil refinery. It's actually in Kuwait, and they were one of the first countries to strike oil in the 40s. And this oil refinery has been producing oil since then. And it's, it, it looks like a city at night. It glows up with all this light. And it's, and it's just... Uh, incredible, and I managed to get this bull camel um, to stand um, alongside it about five to ten minutes after sundown, so there's still some residual light in the atmosphere. Otherwise, my shutter speed, I wouldn't have been able to have got the clarity of it because I needed some more ambient light as well as just what was coming out of the oil refinery. And this is the result. Um, it's a more of a literal type of empathy again. It speaks to a need for a paradigm shift within the context of green technology, uh, a, a revolution which we are currently in, of course. But I feel the bull camel is roaring in anger at the change in his environment, um, which is analogous to man wanting to find a better balance between the built and natural world. I suppose that's what it's really about, um, is, is, is us navigating that space, which is sacred, between how we how we manage this planet. We are stewards of this planet. We are here, um, whether you believe in God or not, we are here in a way as guests. <laughs> and we have to share it with not only our fellow human beings, but also with the other animals. And I remember someone once saying to me, maybe the trick is third, third, third. So third built environment, third cultivated environment, i.e. agriculture, and third pure nature. I, I mean, I'm not an a expert on this, I'm an artist, but I, I, I feel uh, this image is about uh, empathy towards ecology. Mm -hmm. So it's really, yeah, how do we really empathize with the environment then? Mm. Yeah. It's like, how do we, you know, empathize with uh, the animals and the, you know, the streams and the rivers and the, the desert and what yeah. does that really mean? Yeah. Yeah. And staying connected to it, because when we're connected to it, it, it becomes like an extended family. We care. We just got to make ourselves be more cognizant. When we're conscious, we care. I mean, I have two small mm. children. I have two small children. One is four and the other is nearly three. And it, that's fundamentally changed my perspective on the world. From a very selfish perspective, Edwin, is um, I have to make sure the world's a little bit better for them, because it's, you know, a scary old world, especially with you know, what was happening in Connecticut only last month. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was interesting. So it, you're saying that the, as, as we're aware of something, more aware of it, that we care more about it? Is well, I think it's natural. We are human. Mm -hmm. Human beings struggle to care about things which don't affect them personally. We are all culpable of that. I think it's the way we're made. Um, we just have to make, we have to make the world us. We have to somehow have a collective spirit again. It's in us. I believe it's just we haven't had it probably since the high medieval period, <laughs> or mm -hmm. maybe not for, or maybe for millennia. I don't know. I, I mean, I mentioned the high medieval period in the sense of where Gnosticism was within the Christian tradition. You know, uh, in the sense of the esoteric was very was very much respected in the med in the late medieval period, and since then, enlightenment has been great, but the pendulum has swung backwards and forwards, and it's got narrower and narrower. And basically, the 20th century, you end up with a sense of man is actually absurd, existentialism, uh, nihilism, 
man is not really respected or self-respected and we need to now become much more uh, grounded again as human beings and who we are and, 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 our, and our fellow brethren and I, and I want my art to try and help uh, elicit a greater sense of connectivity again. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's that connection. For me that connection is really about creating a culture of empathy so kind of an empathic environment where empathy gets raised to be a, a primary social value yeah, well, I will join you on that on that <laughs> quest. Great. Well, let's take the uh, next photograph. Then we have here. That's the next one on the. Well, this is um, yeah. This is an interesting one because I shot this in East Jerusalem only last month, and and in a way, for me, this image represents really where are we heading, and this tells you more about me as as much as as much about me as it does about uh, the the people in it. Um, I'm on the edge of curiosity here. Um, you know, I'll never know how you feel. You'll never know how I feel. But I'm determined to try and understand you. Um, I'm not advocating something that is so easily resolved, say, as my first image, which is a very uh, literal sense of em empathy. Here, you know, there's actually a three-way conversation going on. There's us, the viewer. There's the Hasidic on the left, and then there's the Muslim ahead of us. Is the Muslim lady looking at him or looking at us? It's a little unclear, but I rather like that. And it's a sense of how can we get closer? Because for me, there's a veil even between him and her. She's obviously wearing a veil and he's wearing his own type of veil within his own Jewish get up. But there's this mistiness in between. There's this veil, which I almost want to lift up because we all have our iconography. We all have our sartorial ways. Our, our differences and we just got to sort of somehow learn more about it and accept the other but we need to communicate we've got to look, sit down again we've lost the ability through ironically through technology technology has been a blessing but it's been a huge curse we we are more separate now than we've been for a long long time because we can hide behind these screens We've got to lift that veil. We've got well, human beings are designed to be in contact with one another. They're not designed to be separate. Mm -hmm. Well, I was hearing a curiosity that you're wanting to foster curiosity that leads to connection. Is that what you're saying? Intense curiosity about the world. Oh, intense curiosity. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, I mean, it's not just everyday curiosity. It's intense curiosity. But, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, but but without that curiosity, empathy is impossible. And you know that, I know that. But it is empathy is simply impossible without that curiosity. We have to keep that curiosity alive. And the cynic will say, well, George, you're lucky. You're an artist. You can find time to do it. I'm too busy paying the mortgage. I'm too busy working. That's an excuse. We have to find time because it will make us better at paying the mortgage. It will make us better business people. I, I work with Nexus Global Youth Summit. And Nexus is a very interesting organization which um, uh, marries business practice with social impact. And, you know, in that sense, most, a lot of some artists consider business to be, you know, nefarious, capitalistic. Well, that can be true. And obviously we see many cases where it is. But business at its best is when it's actually engaging in, social em in, in empathy and social impact. It's when it's interconnected and it's win-win. It's, it's, it's actually, I'm going to win because I'm going to work with you and we're going to build something great which is sustainable and our children can benefit from it. From it. And, and so for me, that's the message of empathy, isn't it? Is, is how we can work together. Mm -hmm. So businesses can work together as well. They don't have to be geared just towards competition and kind of dominance. A business can actually work towards uh, fostering uh, connection. Actually, that's a very interesting point because... Western civilization is totally dynamic and has always been predicated on change, where in a way the Eastern traditions have on the whole been more static and their religions respect, reflect those differences. I think today if the West can learn anything and I think the new paradigm shift, the new civilization, which will take hundreds of years to evolve. I mean, don't forget when Rome collapsed, it took many, many, many hundreds of years um, for Byzantium to, to, to roll into uh, European uh, Western civilization that we have today. But we're moving away now from Western civilization into something different. And I hope w we can have a more of a universalist approach where we can borrow from the East, much like China and India can borrow some of the best things from the West like they've done.
they borrowed the architectural ideas of skyscrapers. Um, some of the business practices come from the West. There are many areas where we can become more syncretic uh, and uh, synch create, syn you know, uh, synchronize more. Uh, syncretic, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and, I, and I think, for, for me, that's what uh, empathy is about, is, 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 is finding that way for us to coexist together. Mm -hmm. So empathy relates the way of connecting with all those different cultures and finding that uh, that way of uh, calling it syncretic, but uh, synchronized with the other two, kind of maybe resonate with them. Yes. Find a resonance. Yes. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Well, I think that was the was there. I think that was the last photograph. Then. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, well, that, that's, uh, I really enjoyed this, this uh, dialogue, and I hope we can kind of continue kind of this exploration, because this is a lifelong quest for me, and it sounds like this is like a, quite a quest for you as well, a, a quest of curiosity and connection, and it sounds like you're going to be doing this, uh, this, this, going in this direction for a while. I will. I mean, I will share one thing with you. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. In spring break in March, my wife and I were going to Bhutan, and I'd never been to Bhutan before, but I've never been to any benevolent theocracy before. I don't believe there are actually very many countries in the world which are based on a benevolent theocracy. And Buddhism um, is going to be very, it's going to be very interesting for me to go and learn um, in Bhutan about how the people live their lives, because they don't really have a capitalist system there. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to sharing some of my ideas from that exploration with you. Oh, uh -huh. You can check out empathy in, in Bhutan, like uh, what's the role of empathy? Um, I like to see a country that really is kind of like, like Bhutan, but that is uh, explicit about empathy, saying that empathy is the, is the primary social value. Well, and what, that, what would that society look like? You well, know? I mean, I, I don't want to second guess, but I would imagine Bhutan, from what I've heard, is very empathetic. They just wouldn't necessarily use that term that we're using. Um, I mean, you know, they have a huge tradition of giving. Um, I mean, they have mendicants. They have uh, most, most people are monks there, and the, and the government provides for them. Um, it, it, it's a very different system to what we're used to in the West, and that's what makes me very interested by it. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, maybe you can report back when you come back and we can uh, follow up uh, at that point. And, and this is really a lot of fun. This is the first time I've uh, tried using this, uh, you know, photo share and, and all that. And it seems to work pretty well. We'll I'll seems... take a look at the video, but this, this was quite fun. Well, Edwin, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on today. Okay, great. Then uh, we'll stay in contact. And okay. thanks a lot, uh, George. All the best. Okay, bye-bye.